Hello, this is Dr. Gardner. We're going to be looking at our second tutorial for Chapter 6, looking at stoichiometry and chemical reactions. I do expect that you've watched our previous tutorial on using the analogy with the turkey sandwich for producing similar types of calculations to the stoichiometry calculations that we'll be doing today. I also expect from that tutorial that you're familiar with stoichiometric ratios and our discussion as an introduction to molar ratios uh, for comparing reactants to products in chemical reactions or in fact comparing any chemical substance in a chemical reaction from the coefficients in the balanced equation. So with that type of background what we're going to be looking at today are several different types of, of basic calculations we can look at when we're considering chemical reactions and the quantities of reactants or products that we would like to compare in those chemical reactions. There's a few pieces of background information I expect that you have already mastered from previous in the course. Uh, so if you need to go back and review these topics by looking at our previous posted tutorials, uh, I expect that you've already uh, mastered balancing chemical reactions by using uh, element inventories and that you can write the correct coefficients for your balanced equations. You'll need those correct coefficients in order to write the correct stoichiometric ratios or molar ratios that we'll be using for these calculations today. I also expect that you can predict uh, products of reactions and that you understand how to classify types of reactions uh, from our previous discussions. And then I expect that you can calculate molar masses or formula weights or molar weights or uh, molecular weights, all synonyms for the same process of finding a molar mass for a chemical compound formula. Uh, also, I expect that you can uh, convert from grams to moles or from moles to grams based on using uh, your molar mass for your compounds. So you expect you have those types of skills, so please go back and review those if you haven't already mastered them. I also expect that you can use Avogadro's number to compare moles to number of particles, number of atoms, number of molecules, number of ions, or number of formula units. Be able to convert from moles to the number of particles or from particles back to the number of moles by using Avogadro's number 6.0 to 2 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. Okay, now once you have all of those topics mastered, I'm also expecting that you can use dimensional analysis calculations in a multi-step uh, unit conversion process because we'll be applying those types of skills. So you notice this chapter, we're really taking a lot of the different types of calculational skills and concepts that we've learned in the course and combining them all together. So this really shows your mastery of many of the topics we've covered already. So make sure you go back and review these. This will be a great chance to review right before the next exam. So please do start looking at those materials materials to be ready for the exam and be ready for the calculations in this chapter. Now what we're covering that's new today is using all these skills together, relating them to balanced equations and also be able to find information about reactants and products or any substance in the balanced equation by relating the stoichiometric coefficients, the numbers in front of the substances in the chem balanced chemical equation, and using those coefficients to produce stoichiometric ratios, also known as molar ratios, for performing calculations. And so that's really the only new thing. Everything else are skills that we should have developed previously. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, what we're going to be looking at is, first of all, uh, the skills to determine a stoichiometric calculation is we're going to write a balanced chemical equation first. So you need to have a correctly balanced chemical equation because if the coefficients are incorrect, then your calculations involving those molar ratios from the coefficients will also give you an incorrect answer. So you want to make sure you've mastered that. Uh, you also need to be able to convert from quantities of a substance, let's say in grams, to the number of moles of those substances in order to compare to the coefficients. You may also have to take the number of particles, or number of molecules, or number of formula units, and use Avogadro's number to convert to number of moles. So really the center of our calculational universe for these types of calculations is once we get to the mole quantities, then we can use our balanced equation and the coefficients in the balanced equation to compare molar ratios, to compare any substance in that balanced equation to any other substance. I can compare reactants to reactants, reactants to products, products to other products, or products back to reactants. We can compare any of the stoichiometric ratios from any of those coefficients to relate to molar ratios. But I have to be able to get to moles first. So converting from grams to moles using molar masses or converting from number of particles to moles using Avogadro's number is a critical skill for some of these calculations in this chapter. You should be able to balance your equations, find the coefficients, and be able to calculate the number of moles of another substance in that 
a balanced reaction by comparing those coefficients in the balanced equation. So we'll be practicing that today uh, in our stoichiometric calculations. Also, you should be able to convert the number of moles of whatever substance you solve for at the end of your calculations to grams using molar mass or to number of particles using Avogadro's number. So that's what we would do last. So here's kind of the steps visually that we could plan out for a calculation like this. So let's say we're given the mass of a reactant. If I have the mass, let's say, in milligrams, I might use a metric conversion to convert to grams. But once I get to grams of that reactant, I can convert to moles by dividing by molar mass. That would give me the molar mass of the reactant if I take grams divided by the molar mass of that substance. I calculate the molar mass based on the formula of the compound I'm looking at. Once I have moles of that reactant, I can convert from moles of that reactant to any other substance in the balanced equation that we have written by looking at the coefficients from the balanced equation. That will produce a molar ratio. So we convert from moles to moles, moles of one substance to moles of another substance in that chemical reaction by using the molar ratio. Once I have the moles of the other substance I'm interested in, in this case we're looking at moles of let's say a product, we can convert from moles to let's say number of grams of the product by multiplying by molar mass. If I were wanting to convert from my moles of my product to the number of molecules or formula units or atoms or particles or ions, we could use Avogadro's number instead and we could go ahead and multiply by Avogadro's number to convert to the number of particles from <coughs> the moles that we had. So I should be able to do both of those types of calculations. Now with this in mind, what we will do sometimes on some of the reactions you'll look at in the course, you have to be able to find the molar masses. I've helped you out with this chemical reaction which is the combustion of propane. So I'm burning propane with oxygen gas to form carbon dioxide and water vapor. I've already calculated the molar mass of all these compounds, but you would want to double check that you could do this on your own if you had to for the exam. Uh, in this case, where I have the molar mass of each compound, that would help me uh, quickly set up the stoichiometry problems and my calculations. Now I want us to think about what this balance equation is telling us. What is the meaning behind the balance equation as written with respect to having a coefficient and coefficients in front of all my reactants and products. Now realize if a coefficient isn't shown, such as in front of propane here, we will assume that that means we have a coefficient of 1. Okay, if I have a coefficient of 5, that in front of oxygen we would show it, a 3 in front of carbon dioxide and 4 in front of water. We make sure we have a balanced equation to begin with. Sometimes your equations may not be balanced, so always double check that you have a balanced equation, especially if you see that none of the coefficients are written. If we're assuming they're all 1s, that may not always be true, so make sure you have balanced your reaction before you get started. Now let's think about what this is telling us about the quantities of propane, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas, and water vapor. You notice here I specifically, even though we don't normally have to write a coefficient in front of propane, I've labeled it in green. I've shown you that it's a 1 there. Normally I don't even bother writing that. Uh, it's assumed if I don't show coefficient that it's 1 though. So let's ask ourselves this question. Can I relate these coefficients to gram quantities? Would it be true to say one gram of propane reacts with five grams of oxygen gas to form three grams of carbon dioxide and four grams of water vapor? Can I relate these coefficients to grams? Hopefully you recognize that we cannot. We cannot relate these coefficients to gram quantities. The reason we can't do that is each one of these substances has a different molar mass. There's a different number of grams per mole for each substance, so I can't directly relate gram quantities to the coefficients in the balanced equation. So please remember that. Different molar masses, uh, each particle has a different mass, so I can't just relate one propane molecule to five diatomic oxygen molecules by comparing one gram to five grams. That's because their molar masses are very different. So I can, however, relate the coefficients to, let's say, number of molecules or particles or ions that we might be looking at or formula units. So in this case, I have all molecules. So I can relate my one for the coefficient for propane to one molecule of propane. I can relate my five for the coefficient in front of oxygen to five molecules of oxygen. I can relate my three in as a coefficient in front of carbon dioxide to three molecules of carbon dioxide. I can relate my four as a coefficient in front of water to four molecules of water vapor. So I can relate those coefficients to numbers of molecules. So another way I could describe this reaction is I could say that one molecule of propane reacts with five molecules of oxygen gas to form, to produce, to yield, so this is what's after my arrow on the right hand side is a product, 
three molecules of carbon dioxide and four molecules of water vapor. So I can state that and that's very true based on these coefficients. I just can't relate them directly to grams without using my molar masses to convert to grams. Uh, now let's consider if I were to scale this reaction up. Now I normally I'm not working in the laboratory with just uh, small numbers of molecules. We normally have much larger quantities than one, five, three, or four molecules. So let's try scaling this up. Would it be true to state that I could have two molecules of propane reacting with 10 molecules of oxygen to yield to produce to end up with six molecules of carbon dioxide and four molecules of water? Sure, that would be true as well, wouldn't it? I've just doubled the quantities on both sides. I've scaled everything up to twice the amount. So that's true as well, so that is a true statement. What if I scaled this up further? What if I had 100 times all the quantities? So I had 100 molecules of propane reacting with 500 molecules of oxygen to yield to produce 300 molecules of carbon dioxide and 400 molecules of water vapor. That would still be true. So I can go ahead and take my coefficients, and as long as I multiply them by the same amount for my coefficients all the way across, I can scale this up to different quantities. So I can go from one molecule plus five molecules yielding three molecules and four molecules, I can multiply all of those coefficients by 100 to yield 100 molecules, plus 500 molecules is yielding 300 molecules and 400 molecules, and that's still a true statement. So I can scale this up. Now, we still probably in the lab are going to be using much larger quantities than hundreds of molecules. So I often will be using a molar quantity. So let's think about this. If I had one times Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of propane, and five times Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of oxygen gas, and three times Avogadro's number of carbon dioxide, and four times Avogadro's number of water vapor, would that still be the same ratios? It definitely would. It still simplifies to a ratio of one to five to three to four. All I've done is scale that up to molar quantity. So I could say that I have one mole of propane reacting with five moles of oxygen gas yields or produces products of three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water vapor. So it's very handy to relate these coefficients directly to numbers of molecules or particles or ions or formula units and we can relate them directly because I've just scaled up the ratios to number of moles. So those coefficients also represent number of mole quantities in the chemical reaction. Just be careful because they don't directly relate to gram quantities without using molar mass. I can relate mole quantities directly to grams by using my molar masses, but they wouldn't equal 1, 5, 3, and 4 grams. So just be cautious about that. So now that we've recognized that in your homework for this chapter, you will have calculations where you have to relate the coefficients to numbers of particles, number of molecules in this case, or to number of moles of those particles, number of moles of those molecules in this reaction. I have to be able to make both of those types of connections with the concepts related to these coefficients in the balanced equation. So now that we've looked at this, let's relate these concepts to a few types of problems. So here's our first example calculation. Let's consider that we're told the following. We're told that two molecules of methanol are going to react with oxygen, and they combine with, the, with oxygen in the form of three diatomic oxygen molecules reacting with the methanol, and they form as products two carbon dioxide molecules and four water molecules. Now you see, notice here that if we check what's going on with the numbers of atoms before and after this chemical reaction, we're following the law of conservation of mass. We're conserving numbers of atoms before and after the chemical reaction. So if I do write the equation for this reaction, I could write the equation with a coefficient of two because we were told two molecules of methanol were reacting. So two molecules of methanol were reacting here and they're combining with three diatomic oxygen molecules and then we're producing or yielding or forming products of two carbon dioxide molecules and four sorry this should be four uh, water molecules so that's a typo it should be H2O there uh, if you look at that then that would relate to the coefficients that we're interested in so 
If we want to consider what this type of reaction is, when we have oxygen combining with other elements, we can define that as a combustion reaction. So this would be a combustion reaction in this case. Now if we asked ourselves how many water molecules would form when 125 methanol molecules react, we can use the coefficients in the balance equation. Just realize this 4 would be before an H2O uh, set of molecules. So I'm using a coefficient of 2 to 4. Two molecules of methanol are yielding four molecules of water in this case. So if I had 125 molecules of methanol, well I have 125 molecules of methanol reacting, but my my stoichiometric ratio, my molecular ratio in this case, or this could scale up to molar ratio for our terminology, tells us that two molecules or two moles of methanol would yield four molecules or four moles of water as a product. So two molecules of methanol for four molecules of water. So if I take 125 molecules that I started with with the methanol, multiply by four and divide by two, we could end up with having a product of 250 molecules of water. So we predicted how much product should form in this case. Now I could simplify this ratio down to a two to one ratio, but I usually will not bother doing that even though I know that's accurate. Uh, because I like to keep the 4 to 2 as my molar ratio so I can readily relate them back to the coefficients of my balanced equation if I were to look back at my notes and understand where they originated from. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, let's work a similar calculation. Let's consider that we have aluminum sulfate. So we take some solid aluminum sulfate. We're going to dissolve it in water. When we dissolve it in water, ionic compounds that are soluble will produce um, will produce ions in a process we call dissociation. So the dissociation of the ionic compound when it dissolves will produce aluminum cations and sulfate anions. So if we had an entire mole of aluminum sulfate that had enough water that we dissolved it in that it could dissociate into ions, we would find that one mole of aluminum sulfate would yield two aluminum cations two moles of aluminum cations and three moles of sulfate ions. I could also say that one formula unit of aluminum sulfate would produce, as it dissolves in water, two aluminum cations and three sulfate ions. So it scales from uh, formula units and ions up to molar quantities from those coefficients as written. Uh, now uh, Aluminum sulfate isn't particularly soluble, so we are assuming here uh, that if it were to dissolve completely, this is what would occur. If we look at the following question then, if I'm asked how many moles of aluminum cations would form in solution during this dissociation process as the aluminum sulfate dissolves, we could say how many moles of aluminum cations form when one mole of aluminum sulfate is dissolving, and we could set up a stoichiometric ratio to compare this. Now I'm getting the stoichiometric ratio from the coefficients of one formula unit of aluminum sulfate to two aluminum cations. And so we say one mole of aluminum sulfate is reacting and we know that for every one mole of aluminum sulfate from the coefficient here, we are yielding two moles of aluminum cations in solution if it all dissolves. Now once we use this molar ratio, we can take the number of moles I begin with, whatever it might be, multiply by two, divide by one, and we can find that we'd have twice the moles of cations than the number of moles of formula units we begin with. So here I have two moles of aluminum cations that are being formed in solution if all of the formula units were to dissociate. Okay. Now let's consider a similar process, but now let's ask ourselves how many moles of sulfate ions would form if the aluminum sulfate was dissolving in water. So if we're looking at the aluminum sulfate dissolving in water, we're going to be yielding three sulfate ions for every one formula unit, or for every mole of aluminum sulfate, we're yielding three moles of sulfate ions. So I can set up the stoichiometric ratio. I can say however many number of moles of aluminum sulfate that are reacting, I know my molar ratio is one mole of aluminum sulfate is dissociating to form three moles of sulfate ions. So we'd end up with three moles of sulfate ions in this case if we look at those ratios. Okay, so hopefully we're becoming comfortable with re relating moles of my substances in the chemical reaction to the coefficients, as well as number of formula units and ions, or in my previous examples, the number of molecules that we might have been looking at can relate to those coefficients. So that's going to be quite helpful in some of my calculations in this chapter. Uh, let's go ahead and
and consider another combustion reaction. Let's look at propane combusting with oxygen gas to yield carbon dioxide and water vapor again. Now here's the following question I would like to answer. If I were to burn 9.21 moles of propane in an excess of oxygen gas, how many moles of carbon dioxide would form? So let's compare my reactants and my products here. So what I'm going to be looking at then is I'm starting with the moles of the reactant of propane I begin with, the 9.21 moles of propane. I'm going to find a molar ratio. Now where am I getting the molar ratio from again? Hopefully you all realize I'm getting the molar ratio from the balanced equation. So I'm looking at the compounds I want to compare. So I'm thinking to myself from the problem I was giving, I want to relate propane to carbon dioxide. I'm told I have an excess of oxygen. That's only important because I'm saying that I'm limited with how much carbon dioxide I can form based on when I run out of propane. Okay, so there's more than enough oxygen. It's an excess. It doesn't run out first. The propane runs out first. It's what we call a limiting reagent. So the propane's consumed, and we'd like to consider how many moles of carbon dioxide perform. So if I look at my balanced equation, we know we should use the coefficient of one mole of propane is reacting for every three moles of carbon dioxide that are formed from this combustion process. So when I go ahead and write my molar ratio, I should be dividing by the moles of what I'm comparing here, the moles of propane in the denominator. So one mole is coming from the coefficient of one here. And then I'm going to be multiplying by the three moles of what I'd like to find out the molar quantity of, the three moles of carbon dioxide. So I have a three to one ratio coming from these two coefficients. Now that's the heart of my stoichiometric problem is relating that stoichiometric ratio, that molar ratio to those co stoichiometric coefficients. So if I take 9.21 moles of propane, multiply by three and divide by one, we'd end up with 27.6 moles of carbon dioxide would form if all of the propane reacts in this chemical reaction. Okay. Now, I can do similar types of calculations with any of these coefficients in the balanced equation. So let's compare maybe uh, the number of products to another set of products. So let's say that I'm told that this chemical reaction is occurring in another situation where I produce 1.14 moles of carbon dioxide from the combustion of this propane. We still have an excess of oxygen gas. I'm curious though if I produce 1.14 moles of carbon dioxide, how many moles of water vapor would have also have formed? So you notice I can compare the coefficients of two products as well. I can compare any of the coefficients in the this balanced equation. So I begin with the substance I have information about. I have 1.14 moles of carbon dioxide. The molar ratio I'm getting from the, the coefficients in front of the two substances I'm comparing. So I'm looking at the coefficient in front of CO2 and the coefficient in front of H2O. I'm dividing by the stoichiometric coefficient for the substance I begin with. So I'm dividing by three moles of carbon dioxide. The three is coming from this coefficient. Then I'm multiplying by the, co the stoichiometric coefficient for the other substance I would like to compare to that I'm trying to find out the quantity of here. So I'd take the four. So I'm multiplying by four moles of water are being formed for every three moles of carbon dioxide that are forming okay, in this balanced equation. So if I take 1.14 moles of carbon dioxide times four and divide it by three, that's the heart of my stoichiometry problem, being re able to relate these coefficients from the balanced equation to set up this molar ratio, the stoichiometric ratio. We find that we would have 1.52 moles of water that should have also have formed in this reaction. Okay, so we can relate any of these stoichiometric ratios. Uh, let's say we would like to compare uh, a product back to a reactant. So let's say we're told this reaction occurs and 5.33 moles of water vapor were formed when we combust the propane. But we would like to know how many moles of oxygen must have reacted with the fuel. The fuel is the propane here. The hydrocarbon fuel contains carbon and hydrogen. Uh, in this case, we're beginning with the 5.33 moles of water. So I need the coefficient here for my molar ratio, my stoichiometric ratio. So I'm looking at the 4 in front of water, but I would like to relate it in this case back to oxygen. So I relate it to the coefficient of 5 in front of oxygen. So for every 4 moles of water vapor that formed, we must have reacted 5 moles of oxygen gas. So I'm dividing by moles of water to cancel my units here. And so I multiply 5.33 times 5 divided by 4. That's the heart of my stoichiometry problem, this stoichiometric ratio, this molar ratio from the coefficients from the balanced equation. 
That gives me 6.66 moles of oxygen must have been consumed to produce the 5.33 moles of water vapor that we observed that we collected at the end of the reaction as a product. So I can I can convert molar quantities of anything in this balanced equation as long as I have the coefficients for it. It can be uh, reactants to products, it can be products compared to another product, it can be products compared back to reactants, or if I wanted to I can compare uh, the amount of one reactant reacting with another reactant. Uh, now let's go ahead and consider if I'm given a gram quantity. So if I don't start with moles, if I'm not in the center of my calculational universe for these stoichiometry calculations, I might be given a gram quantity. If I'm given a gram quantity, let's say of a reactant, so here I've given you all of the molar masses to help you out, but you should be able to calculate these molar masses if you had to. Um, I'm told that I had 125.8 grams of propane reacting, so I'm given a mass this time of a reactant rather than the mole quantity. The coefficients, as you recall, do not directly relate to gram quantities until you consider their molar masses. Okay, now I would like to know if this is how many grams of propane that reacts, how many moles of water vapor should form, assuming that the propane runs out and I have excess oxygen present. Okay, so I take the grams of the propane, Divide by the molar mass of the propane. So I'm dividing by 44.11 grams of propane for every one mole. So I divide by the molar mass of the substance I would like to convert from the mass of grams to to moles. If I had a mass unit other than grams, like milligrams or kilograms, I might have to do a metric conversion first as one additional step. Here we had gram quantities to begin with, so I just go ahead and divide by molar mass. And I get to the center of my calculation universe for my stoichiometry calculation right away. I get to molar quantities. Okay, so at this point I would have 2.852 moles of propane. Once I have my moles of propane, I can use my stoichiometric ratio from my balanced equation coefficients to relate the substances I want to compare. So I look back at my question, I'm comparing propane, so I want to use the coefficient of 1, and I'd like to relate that to the product, the water vapor that's forming, so I have a coefficient of 4 there. So I have a 1 to 4 relationship. So for every 1 mole of propane, I'm dividing by the 1 mole in the denominator, cancel units of moles of propane. I'm producing 4 moles of water vapor, so I'm multiplying by 4. I like to always specify what it is I'm talking about the moles of by writing the units down for it as moles of whatever formula that I have. That way I don't invert these because I'm relating it directly to the coefficient and directly to the formula in my molar ratio. So I have one mole of propane to four moles of water vapor. Some of you may decide to take some shortcuts and just write four, one mole to four moles and that's where you can get in trouble if you're not writing the formula unit down because you might invert this and not see it from your units without writing that formula unit. So it is a good habit to write down everything. Moles of what? Moles of what here? It relates directly to the equation, so you can glance back and check your work and hopefully avoid any errors. Okay, so once I take 2.852 moles of propane times 4, we'll have our answer for the number of moles that I'm looking at. The Really, the only new type of calculation I'm doing here is the stoichiometric ratios uh, being used, the, the molar ratios being used. I already knew how to convert from grams to moles for molar mass calculations in the past. So I find that I would produce 11.41 moles of water vapor in this case, if all of the propane had reacted. Okay, now what if I wanted to know the grams of the product? So let's convert from grams of a reactant to grams of a product. So now I'm going to have conversions involving molar masses on both ends of my calculation. So again, we start with 125.8 grams of uh, propane, but I would like to know how many grams of water vapor forms. So the first several steps are identical. We convert from grams of propane to moles of propane by dividing by the molar mass of the substance we're looking at. That gives me the 2.852 moles of, of propane. Then I do the heart of my stoichiometry problem. I convert from moles of propane to moles of water by using my stoichiometric coefficients. Right, My 1 is coming from the coefficient in front of propane here. My 4 is coming from the coefficient in front of the water vapor. That would give me the 11.41 moles of water. That was our answer for the previous calculation on the previous slide. 
So what I'm doing that's new this time is I would like to know not the moles of water, but the grams of water. So I need to use a molar mass again. But I am not reusing the molar mass for propane because now we're talking about moles of water. So I need the molar mass for the product, for the water, which is 18.02 grams per mole. As you recall, I'm getting this molar mass from the periodic table. The molar mass for oxygen is 16. The molar mass for hydrogen is 1.01 .01 per hydrogen. I add that up 1.01 .01 plus 1.01 .01 plus 16 gives me the 18.02 grams per mole. So you should be able to calculate those molar masses. So now instead of dividing by the molar mass, since I'm not converting from grams to moles, I want to convert from moles back to grams, I'm multiplying by the molar mass. So I have 18.02 grams of water that are reacting for every one mole of water that was produced. Okay, so I end up producing 205.6 grams of water vapor. The only new part to the calculation here today is that molar ratio calculation. You already had worked on problems where you converted from grams to moles by dividing by molar mass, and you already knew how to convert from grams to moles, or sorry, from moles back to grams by multiplying by molar mass. So you've done those types of calculations. The only new thing is relating these ratios based on the coefficients from the bounce equation. So multiplying by four, that's the only new type of step in the calculation you had to do here. You do notice, though, it's very useful to be able to set up multiple step dimensional analysis, unit conversion calculations here for these types of problems, which is why I had you master those skills earlier on. Okay, so let's look at a similar type of calculation. Let's say that we have 209 grams of another fuel. Now I'm going to take methanol, combust it with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water vapor. I want to make sure I have a bounce equation to so check that your coefficients are all balanced. I can do an element inventory if I need to to ensure that. Uh, calculate the molar mass of any substances that you need to compare in, in the reaction. So in this case I would have could have gotten away which is calculating the molar mass of methanol as 32.05 grams per mole and the molar mass of water of 18.02 grams per mole and that, those are the only molar masses I would have needed for this specific calculation even though I gave you all of the molar masses in this case. So if I begin with 209 grams of methanol, which is also known as uh, wood alcohol, it's quite uh, toxic. It metabolizes formaldehyde in the body, which can attack your optic nerve and can make you go blind. Uh, but it, you can also burn it as a fuel. Okay, so if I take the grams of methanol, here's my plan for the calculation. I'm going to convert from grams of methanol to moles of methanol by dividing by the molar mass of methanol. Then I would like to convert from moles of methanol to moles of water vapor by using my stoichiometric ratios. Once I have my moles of water vapor, I plan to convert to grams of water vapor by multiplying by my molar mass of water. So those are each of the steps. So sometimes when you have these multi-step calculations, it's very helpful to plan out every step in the calculation like this. So this is kind of a solution map that I've drawn out. Now let's go ahead and set up the dimensional analysis for this calculation. I begin with 209 grams of methanol. I'm going to convert from grams of methanol to moles of methanol. So I want to divide by my molar mass. So my grams of methanol units will cancel and I'll have moles of methanol. Then once I have my moles of methanol, I can use my stoichiometric ratio. Now which coefficients do we want to use for that molar ratio, that stoichiometric ratio for the next calculation step to convert moles of methanol to moles of water? Well, I want to compare the coefficient in front of methanol, the substance I begin with. That's what I'm going to be dividing by. And I want to multiply by the coefficient in front of the moles of the substance I would like to convert to. So I'm dividing by the, the coefficient of what I'm converting from, multiplying by the coefficient of what I'm converting to in this case. Okay, so I take two moles of methanol are reacting for every four moles of water vapor that it's produced. So two moles of methanol to four moles of water vapor. I could simplify this to a two to one ratio, but I usually will not do that because if you came back to check your work later or you were interrupted, it would be very easy to check what you were doing because you could see that two came from the coefficient here in the bounce equation and the four came from this coefficient in the bounce equation. Whereas if I had simplified this to a two to one ratio, you might forget where those numbers were coming from. Okay, so at this point I would have moles of water vapor if I stopped and wrote down my answer from my calculator. If I want to convert to the mass of water, to the grams of water, let's say, I multiply by the molar mass of water of 18.02 grams of water for every one mole of water. Now this would yield, I can ch double check all my units are canceling, it would yield grams of water that I produce, so I produce 235 grams of water vapor in this case. Okay. 
So the heart of the stoichiometry problem was really just this molar ratio related to the coefficients of the two substances I wanted to compare in the chemical reaction. So you want to practice quite a few of these types of problems, so make sure you practice all of your homework problems related to stoichiometry calculations. Make sure you master those because we'll keep using stoichiometry calculations like this throughout the entire course. We'll keep revisiting it in multiple chapters. We'll use it in the gas law chapters. We'll be using it in our solutions chapters. So you'll see it over and over and over again with different types of chemical reactions. So make sure you practice quite a few of these and be well prepared to do well on the next exam with these types of calculations as well. Okay. Now let's say I'd like to know if I have 290 grams of methanol that were used in combustion. I'd like to know how many molecules of oxygen gas were used in this reaction. So now we have a new step. The first part is similar to what we already did. I convert from grams of methanol to moles of methanol by dividing by the molar mass of the methanol. And I can convert from moles of methanol to moles of oxygen by comparing these two reactants, I can compare the coefficient of 2 in front of methanol to the coefficient of 3 in front of oxygen. So you notice I didn't have to compare to a product in this case. I can compare any of the coefficients in the balanced equation. Once I have my moles of oxygen from this molar ratio, I can relate moles of oxygen in this case not to grams. If I wanted grams of oxygen, I could have multiplied by the molar mass of diatomic oxygen, which is 32 grams per mole. But since I wasn't asked for the grams of oxygen, I was asked for the molecules of oxygen, we want to use Avogadro's number for this last step to convert from moles to molecules, moles to number of particles. So I went ahead and took the 209 grams of methanol. I still divide by the molar mass of methanol to convert to moles of methanol. My molar ratio is different than the previous calculation because now I'm comparing two moles of methanol for every three moles of oxygen that reacted. I know this because there's two moles of the substance I begin with in from the coefficient in the balanced equation is reacting with three moles of the other reactant of the oxygen gas in this case. So I have my two moles of methanol reacting with three moles of oxygen and then we would yield in this case uh, the moles of oxygen. If I want to find the molecules of oxygen I can go ahead and take 6.022 times 10 to the third molecules of oxygen Avogadro's number multiplied by the number of moles and that would give me a total of 5.89 times 10 to the 24th molecules of oxygen that I was producing. Okay. Now what we've seen is we can combine our stoichiometry calculations with these molar ratios to conversions from grams to moles using molar masses or we can convert from moles to numbers of particles by using Avogadro's number. So we can combine both of those types of concepts here. Now if I had uh, butane, which is the fuel that they use in cigarette lighters, butane when it combusts with oxygen gas would form carbon dioxide and water vapor. Uh, in this case all the coefficients you might assume are one, but that would be incorrect. So I happen to be screaming at you here with those red lines under where the coefficient should be that we should balance our equation first of all. So if I balance my equation, we're going to find we get 2 to 13 to 8 to 10. Okay. Now what I would like to ask is how many grams of butane must be burned to generate 880 milligrams of carbon dioxide. Now, since I know I want to compare butane, which is C4H10, that's the fuel I'm using, to the carbon dioxide, the product that I'm forming, I calculated the molar mass of butane from four carbon atoms and ten hydrogens, and the molar mass of carbon dioxide from one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. I wrote down my molar masses that I would use for this calculation. And where I begin with 880 milligrams of carbon dioxide, the mass of a product, since it's in milligrams, I had to add an extra step to my calculation. I have to do a metric system unit conversion. So I have to know my metric system as well for these types of calculations. So 880 milligrams of carbon dioxide, if I, I want to convert that to grams, so I can use my molar mass here for the next step, I want to realize that there's a thousand milligrams to grams. So I convert from milligrams to grams, first of all. Once I convert to grams of carbon dioxide, I could convert to moles of carbon dioxide by using the molar mass of carbon dioxide. So I'm going to go ahead and divide by 44.01 grams per mole of carbon dioxide. So there's 44.01 grams of carbon dioxide for every one mole of carbon dioxide. Now, once I have my moles of carbon dioxide, 
I would like to compare to the other substance, the product I'm relating to in this question. I would like to compare the moles of carbon dioxide back to the moles of the fuel, the butane C4H10. I know 8 moles of carbon dioxide will have formed for every 2 moles of butane that were combusted, were consumed as a reactant in this reaction. So, I write 8 moles of carbon dioxide I'm dividing by the moles of the substance I began with. I'm multiplying by the 2 moles, the moles of the substance I'm comparing to. And so it's a 2 to 8 molar ratio. Now make sure you write your units down so you can see that carbon dioxide cancels out and that you get the moles of the butane that would be consumed in this chemical reaction. Now that would give me the moles of butane, but I'd like to the grams of butane. So I need to multiply by the molar mass of butane of 58.12 grams of butane for every one mole of butane. And this multiple step calculation is roughly as long as you could expect most of the calculations to be in the course. Uh, that would give me the grams of butane that must have combusted being 0 0.291 grams of butane. Makes sense it's a fairly small mass of butane because I was dealing with milligram quantities of the carbon dioxide to begin with. The only other step I might add to something like this is if I had you maybe convert to the number of butane molecules, in which case you would have multiplied by Avogadro's number instead of by molar mass. Or I could have had you convert from the grams of the butane to, let's say, kilograms of butane by dividing by 1,000 grams for every 1 kilogram. So I could have added another metric conversion on the other end. But that's about about as challenging as these simple stoichiometry problems can be. Uh, now, in our next tutorial, we'll be looking at limiting reagents when one substance will run out before another, and we'll have to decide which one of these reactants runs out first. So that's what we'll be looking at next time. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, when you have excess compounds, how much might be left behind in, in the excess. And then we'll be calculating uh, theoretical yields, relating those to what we call actual yields, and calculating percent yields in the next, next tutorial. But we'll be using the same skills that we discussed in this video tutorial in that one, so make sure you master these types of calculations. I recommend that you work quite a few of the homework problems before the next discussion. Okay, have a great day, everybody.